good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, sorry. Um, before the meeting is opened uh, by the presidents of the Disability Intergroup, I just wanted to give you some practical information to start. My name is Catherine Nocton and I'm working for the European Disability Forum and EDF is the secretariat for the Intergroup, so we've helped to set up this meeting that the Intergroup are having today. You will be able to find captioning in the chat box. So if you have a look at your panel for GoToWebinar, you should be able to find the captioning link. If you have any trouble at all with technical issues, then please contact Raquel via the chat box and she will help you. You should be able to see sign language interpretation. We have two interpreters working with us today, welcoming Gardenand and Lisa. Our captioning is provided by WIM. As you know from the registration, the meeting is recorded and we will make it publicly available on the website of the Disability Intergroup. It may be that not all your questions can be answered today by members of the Parliament, but all of the questions which you register in the question box, we will take note of and in the final report of the meeting, which we will publish, we will include your questions and answers. This is just to tell you in case we don't get everything completed today. On Twitter, you can uh, talk about this meeting using the hashtag of the Disability Intergroup, which is EP Disability, or hashtag COVID-19 Disability, which is the hashtag been used by the Global Disability Movement. So um, with those practical notes, I'm going to pass the floor to um, MEP Adam Kosa, firstly, to make an opening statement. Uh, I give you the floor, Adam. All right, hello, everyone. Dear members of the Bureau, dear colleagues, first, I would like to thank you for all colleagues in EDF um, involved in organizing this first ever online meeting of the Disability Intergroup. Also, dear Commissioner Dali, welcome. Special thanks for creating an accessible meeting with sign language interpretation and live captioning. So our aim is to improve the functioning of the intergroup also in this unprecedented time. And thank you for removing some access barriers. I have five points I would like to share with you. First of all, I would like to call myself a man of hope. I believe every challenge creates an opportunity. It seems that this coronavirus epidemic creates a completely new situation for everyone. A huge challenge. But also an excellent opportunity to make spectacular progress in protecting the interests of people with disability. An excellent opportunity also to make progress on certain issues. I call on you to identify the problems to get them all and to give our power and energy and devote them to solutions. Secondly, recently I've become aware that society's sensibility increases during times of restraint. We are paying attention now to each other during this period. It's hard to grow in a society in which one's important problems are treated as non existent. Therefore, we must take advantage of the current opportunities going further together and not so well. Thirdly, the value of technological developments is also increasing now. 
communication, work, and other areas of life have been shifted to the internet. Digital accessibility has become even more important during this period. Also due to the rapid growth of information and interactive services provided on the internet and through mobile devices. Online banking, shopping, using public services should be accessible for all people. Making websites and apps more accessible results in an overall better user experience for everyone, not only for people with disabilities. Fourthly, it is our responsibility as politicians to not leave these issues unused and to transpose them into legislation in the future. I strongly believe that we, not, we do not grow when things are easy. We grow when we are facing challenges. Fifthly, and finally, thinking now of deaf people, let me give one concrete example. Sign language interpretation in the media on measures related to the coronavirus epidemic now have become commonly used. How other, in what other way could deaf people understand the essential precaution measures without sign language interpretation or without captioning? Sign language interpretation or captioning through media publications is now available in every member state. Moreover, also the European Commission is starting to use it. In the long run, this will lead to an increased acceptance of sign languages. Based on these facts, we certainly agree that the responsibility of the disability interview during this period is enormous. That's why this webinar is very useful. It's necessary to support the exchange of ideas and each other's work. And as I already mentioned, we give our power and energy to solutions. I wish all the best of luck to the EDF and good work for everyone. My colleagues in this video group and everyone. All the best to you all. Thank you for watching. Thank you so much for those opening remarks. And I would just like to give the floor now to Mr. Brando Benique, or another president of the Disability Intergroup. Brando, you have the floor. Hi. Um, hi. I think now you can you can hear me. Um, first of all, I want to, to thank uh, all of you for being here. Uh, this is uh, the first uh, um, uh, online meeting ever, I think, of the disability intergroup, also in this in this form, uh, for the new legislative term of the European Parliament. One of the first uh, meetings, in fact, in general for this term. Um, I'm glad uh, to find uh, my friend and colleague uh, Adam Kosha, and some of you I've already seen uh, well and and ready to discuss uh, today and to be active in this uh, in this. Uh, a discussion. Obviously, we would have preferred to start our work for this mandate um, not uh, in uh, in these conditions. But obviously, um, I mean, we, we we are ready uh, to work in this new in this new world that is being uh, built, in fact, uh, by also what is uh, has been happening in terms of the, the diffusion of the virus. Um, so uh, let me express uh, the greatest solidarity to relatives and friends and victims uh, that we all know, unfortunately, of the pandemic across uh, Europe 
as well as to those uh, uh, suffering from loneliness and the greatest difficulties. Um, I think that uh, I can speak in the name of, of everyone here that we are with, uh, with uh, we can say that we are with you uh, from the deepest of our, of our hearts. Um, and these, obviously, these conditions uh, also are uh, related to, uh, to, to people with, dis with, dis with disabilities. To some extent, it's paradoxical um, that even today, when the mainstream population more than ever can understand the challenges, the difficulties that people with disabilities suffer in their lives, and is experiencing some of the daily fears and concerns uh, that they, they experience all the time, uh, we risk anyway, in this context, we have to be honest, that once again, people with disabilities are pushed back at the end of the spectrums of the most important uh, topics and, and questions to be dealt with, their, their rights, the rights of people with disabilities risk to be put uh, at the end of the priorities. Uh, but we cannot, we cannot allow that. We cannot allow that. The European Union uh, needs to, uh, to react. If it wants to continue to exist, uh, it needs to prove it is able to build a, really an inclusive society. This is not only about uh, uh, euro bonds, recovery plans and economic uh, decisions. Uh, it's about um, a, a matter, first of all, of equal rights for everybody. Um, and I, I think that we, we really see now the risk and the attacks also to our democracy, to our way of living uh, by uh, a situation where some people could think that authoritarian solutions, uh, 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 one person deciding for everyone, not a democracy like we, we experience also as representatives, like like uh, like uh, as a member of European Parliament, I can obviously obviously say um, uh, to be a better solution to have uh, one deciding for all, uh, some authoritarianism. Uh, I don't think this is a good solution, but to make uh, a good argument against this this uh, this way of thinking that is uh, entering into the discussion today, uh, we need to be eff effective in protecting human rights uh, and uh, basic rights of, of everyone and to uh, bring equality uh, for real into the lives of everyone that is uh, experiencing this, this very, very um, peculiar moment for, for everyone, but even more, I would say, for, for people with, uh, with disability. So this is the topic also of the meeting of today, how to guarantee equal rights for, uh, for everybody in the current scenario. We will uh, listen to EDF uh, members analyzing the situation um, from uh, the ethical considerations in the process of evaluating conditions of people sick with uh, virus while accessing to healthcare, to the issue of multiple discriminations of the most vulnerable people, also the, the issue of suspension of vital services to the situation of people segregated in institutions, and we will go on with, with, with these topics that are all very important. We are honored also and glad to host Commissioner Daly that will speak uh, after, um, after this, this, this first part to also give the Commission's response. A speech arrives after yesterday, public commitment of high-level representatives of the European Commission, among which uh, the Commissioner Daly herself, to work on the issues of funding, staffing and providing protective equipment to social services. We were very much, we very much welcome this support and therefore we will be glad to listen to more details on this from Commissioner Dali. It will be, be then the turn to MEPs to discuss more in depth also possible actions from the side of the parliament and from the disability intergroup members. I think we all look forward to start the concrete discussion um, after this uh, first round of int introductory uh, points. Uh, so I, I, I will leave the floor immediately to Mr. President uh, Varda Castanis, and I would like to thank EDF for the precious work for all of us. It's it's amazing to see that we are almost 300 people connected. Uh, it gives the clear message that we are ready to fight for a more equal Europe for everyone. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much uh, to our two presidents for their opening words. Um, and now we will hear from Yanis Vardikastanis, the president of EDF, some opening words. Yanis, are you going to put your camera on? Perfect. Welcome. Thank you, Catherine. Before I begin my presentation, on behalf of the European Disability Movement, I would like to express our sorrow and our condolences to the victims with disabilities of this COVID-19 pandemic, but also the victims of neglect. And also, I would like to salute all those colleagues, friends and allies in the disability movement and in society that have been working tirelessly to support persons with disabilities in this unprecedented situation that we have found ourselves in. Dear members of the disability in the group, dear Commissioner for Equality, dear colleagues, Dear friends, I would like to thank all of you for participating in today's online meeting. And of course, I would like to thank the Disability Review Bureau for holding this meeting today. It is absolutely imperative that we have this discussion, which is happening during the crisis, during the sufferings that our people are experiencing. The current COVID-19 crisis has dramatically impacted on persons with disabilities. Neglect and exclusion are putting persons with disabilities in a great danger to say that this neglect and exclusion are recurrent. Many governments and authorities, including the EU institutions themselves, have forgotten persons with disabilities when deciding on emergency, emergency measures and recovery plans. The and if you remember the 15% of the population, those with disabilities, and even fewer remember the obligations their countries are bound to by the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Article 5 on equality and non discrimination. Article Nine on accessibility. Article 10 on the right to life. Article 11 on situations of risk and humanitarian emergencies. Article 25 on health. In all these areas, the motto guiding the UNCRPD and the European Disability Movement, nothing about us without us was neglected. This has caused deaths, many deaths. Pe this has caused despair. This has caused pain for millions of people. The overwhelming majority of adjustments to respect those commitments came only after very strong advocacy work from the organizations of persons with disabilities to their governments, to the media, and to the international organizations. We witness horrific situations that make us feel second class citizens. Medical guidance, guidelines, 
prioritizing persons with disabilities, denial of medical of medical healthcare on the grounds of disability, institutions that have become hotbeds of infection and they have been left just alone. Emergency messages from government, governments and authorities that are completely inaccessible for persons with disabilities and uh, confinement measures with no flexibility for those who struggle most burden. Domestic violence increasing, especially for women and girls with disabilities, more about the risk of suffering. Support services with no protection, no staff and no funding to carry on. From the beginning, EDF and our members have been mobilized, have been outspoken to raise all these issues to the EU institutions, to the heads of the of states, to authorities, to all those who take decisions and forget their commitment and ignore their commitments. We need the EU to take a strong stand in protecting persons with disability, our organizations, etc., services, etc. We cannot stand anymore endless political discussions among countries within the EU institutions. We need to understand that the lives of persons of, of European citizens are at stake. The European project is, is itself is at stake. And that's why today's discussion is of paramount importance. We need to arrive, we need to agree on clear actions, on a clear approach. The European Commission needs to take action and undertake initiatives towards the other institutions and, of course, the governments, and to use all the necessary mechanisms they have, the semester and other mechanisms, but they need to be fast. The protection of lives of people needs fast action. The parliament also, the council, we need to work. Now the Europeans need the European Union more than ever before. What we knew before the crisis is over. What is coming is unknown. We need to be at the forefront to protect the rights of persons with disabilities, first and foremost, <laughs> the right to life. Thank you very much. Yanis, thank you very, very much. And at this point, we have a session of inputs from a number of speakers coming from across Europe, many from countries that are deeply affected by COVID-19. And they will speak very briefly about some of the most important issues from the disability movement that we would like the members of European Parliament and our other partners in the European Commission who are here today to, to hear about. So the first person I will give the floor to is Vice President of the European Disability Forum, Anna Palaez, and she is coming through to us from Spain. Anna, would you like to put on your mic or just your, uh, or your camera? Hello, it's okay? Yes, we can hear you. Ah, thank you very much. Distinguished member of the Disability Intergroup of the European Parliament, distinguished commissioner of equality, 
dear colleagues of the disability movement, dear friends, it for me a really honor to be here, to be part of this important meeting, to talk about the situation during the pandemic of people with disabilities. I would like to talk in this occasion about the vulnerability, the violation of human rights for people with disability, and also especially taking into consideration the situation of women and girls with disabilities. Violation of human rights, which happened because the government forgot about us, about people with disabilities who are, we are not part of the answers that we expect from the government. And this is why we are really um, in, us, in, in the situation, in a risk of situation for, for discrimination about the treatment, about the access to the, the, the right to health mentioned by our president. Um, in the first moment, we must say that the, the answer about the uh, accessibility of information were not considered for many people with disabilities in the whole Europe, in the EU, all the countries. The answer and the information about the pandemic uh, wasn't accessible and not inclusive. And also the people with disability were not mentioned in this important moment. We hear every day that a virus is affected for equality everyone, but it's not true because the answers from the government are not equal for everyone and we are forgotten and we are more risk to suffer for the virus and to die. I would like to give you some example with just information which came to us just this morning, this um, um, week. For example, about situation in Romania for people in institutions, people with disability. For example, talking about an institution in Saskanica where 242 people with disabilities living in this institution were infected by the virus. But the answer, the only answer were just not to take these people to go to the hospital. The situation, the answer was to take the staff to go to the hospitals and to leave people with disabilities in the institution. Something similar were also affecting in another institution in um, Romania, in Costana. In this occasion, 68 people with disabilities in this institution was infected by the virus, but the answer was the same. Take the staff from the institution to go to the hospital and to protect them, but nothing about the people in the institution. But that's happened not just in Romania. Unfortunately, that's happened every day in every country in the EU. I'm going to give you some example. For example, by the end of March in, in, our, uh, in Italy, in an institution for people with intellectual disabilities, for example, uh, 70 were infected by the virus just because they didn't have any uh, PPE to protect them about the infection. When we are talking, for example, about Spain, 43 people died with disabilities in an in institution for uh, older people and without any appropriate um, answer. We have also some data in relation with other institutions in, 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 in Spain, for example, in Granada. When we are talking about France, for example, um, last Monday, um, in an article uh, published by Le Monde, we can uh, read very clearly the answer about the situation, for example, for people with disabilities in institutions. Doctors decided not to go in the institutions because they were afraid to, 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 to be uh, um, contaminated also by the virus. And so, and even the, the national services for emergency in France, when they receive different calls from this institution about to please send to us an ambulance for somebody to go to hospitals, finally, the answer was, please don't, we cannot take into consideration this situation. 
we can offer to you psychiatric service for the staff and a unit for 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 a better uh, diet for the people that was the answer but for example when we we look at the legislation we can discover also that there are big mistakes in, in, in relation with Article 25. For example, when we are talking about the triage, and the triage, um, and for example, uh, to give an example from another country, Germany. Germany uh, denied to change their own legislation in triage uh, because they say that the, the decision for triage, triage is just for the doctors. But the doctor has a um, um, stereotype about the, the, the people with disabilities. So this is all about age. And this is why these people, uh, older people and people with disabilities are really denied to go to this, this treatment for emergency. When we are talking about Belgium, for example, we can say that the, the, the equality body uh, has already um, record the situation of the denounce for many people with disabilities who are denied for medical attention, as well as, for example, older people in this situation. When we are talking, for example, also about the people who need highest uh, support, the situation is uh, also very complex during the pandemic. For example, in many uh, countries, uh, for example, the centers to uh, look after the people during the day has already closed, and the people who need um, high support uh, for, for, for living every day have to go to home without any support for the families, for example. Anna. And, Yes. Anna, could I just ask you, because we've got very short interventions from each board member, if you could start to um, uh, wrap up, if that would be possible. Yes, thank you. Sorry about that. Finally, I would like to talk about the situation of women and girls with disabilities, who, as it was mentioned by our president, the risk of violation and the risk of discrimination is very high. And because uh, we don't have any kind of answer in relation to be protected about, for example, sexual violence, domestic violence, all these days. Also, um, women with disability has to very often look after after children without any support, living alone with them. So this is why we wonder how we believe on the CRPD. Next Monday, we are going to celebrate the 12 years of entry into force of the CRPD, but we see very clearly don't, nobody believes on the CRPD. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna, for all of the details on human rights violations and on the situation of women with disabilities. So, Anna, you can um, switch off your mic. And now we will hear from uh, Luisa Bosicio, who is our board member from Italy. And she is, of course, in Italy, uh, just like Spain being one of the first countries to be very dramatically affected by um, COVID-19. and. Louisa will tell us about the effect on services for people with disabilities. You're very welcome, Louisa. Can I hear your voice? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Can you hear me? Can you yes, hear very me? well. Yes. Very well. Okay. Okay. I go very straight to the point because I have a lot of things to say. First of all, I give you good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I will uh, briefly outline the, the effect that the pandemic had on support services for persons with disability, on residential institutions and other disability-related services. Persons with disability lose fundamental support almost overnight with catastrophic repercussions. The most obvious, dramatic, and downright horrible effect has been seen in residential institutions, as my colleague Anna said. Very, very high rates of infection and death. You can easily remember what she mentioned about cases in Romania. Terrible cases. I would add more from my country. In Sicily, as 
just said to learn it of the history okay. should we seek yes can i just come in a second we've got a lot of background noise while you're speaking and i'm but not I sure have if... any any other i have any other uh, devices open huh? okay perfect anyway i i hope it's just certainly for me i hear a lot of background noise and i'm not sure how it is for the interpreters and the captioner anyway i okay i will let you go ahead i'll turn off my mic anyway i i can go ahead yes please do i'm sorry okay. to interrupt you louisa no no don't, don't, don't worry uh, in Lombardy, a psychiatric health care residence with 320 women at the, at the end of March, 22 women died. In a central northern region, in a residence for persons with disability, currently has 11 deaths out of 61 guests with intellectual disability, many of whom died in hospital and those hospitalized who survived did not fare much better. In the COVID world, there is no time to respond to the needs of non-collaborating who are tied to the beds for the duration of the hospitalizations. Those of them who survived the infection left the hospital in dramatic physical and psychic condition with slimming up to 10 kilos and scary psychic regressions. This example show how it is the reality. It show how authorities are consciously deprioritizing the health of those institutions. Research show that half of Europe coronavirus related death happen in care homes. Uh, let me say a word on this. The high num number of these deaths means that first, these citizens were judged expandable. We need emergency plans and therefore pandemic emergency plan that include person with disability. Today, it isn't. Second, these systems were not designed to be inclusive. We need alternative measures to the institutionalization. Such institutions were created to provide protection, but by now evidence has shown they didn't protect anyone. We must think differently and build innovation and this pandemic will give us an opportunity. Relaunch, reinforce, rethink the EU plan of the institutionalization. The pandemic may open up opportunity for change or we will live like before. Absenteeism and lack of protection means that is not all infection rates that are high. Abuse and neglect too. This is a situation that we observe across Europe, and it is complicated by the fact that the residential institutions often have stricter lockdown conditions where patients cannot even have one visitor, often cannot even leave their room, and are frequently denied even the means to contact loved ones by phone or video. This made much more difficult for residents to report cases of abuse and, and, and neglect and to seek help. Community-based services are not very much better. Support workers are not prioritized to receive protective equipment and as you can imagine, social distancing is not a possibility. It becomes very likely for, for them to get sick and infect others. Many authorities cannot provide solution or alternative if support worker gets sick or need to quarantine. Even worse, we heard cases where the solution was to go to an institution. Many people had to choose between receiving support or getting infected because they had no other choices. We learned about a person in Belgium that had to make this decision. I want to underline how outrageous the lack of protective equipment has been. Myself had to spend days in the car traveling to pick up purchases of personal protective equipment because there was any available due to requisition by the authority as they were all intended for hospital and sometimes avoiding scams. It is not only this uh, residential institution and community-based ba community support that are suffering through. All disability-related services were already underfunded and many had to adapt and find 
creative solutions to continue supporting people, often at their own expenses. We know of education services providing a phone line open 20 hours for seven days and teacher calling twice a day. This is being done at great expense of the services and their staff. Why we comment this activity, we are very displeased with the lack of support and funding from local, regional, or national authorities. In Italy, the suspension of lessons in attendance do not guarantee didactic continuity, especially for those with intellectual disability, but not only, that are de facto excluded from distant learning mode, relegating them to the end of the list. This means that students with disability will have even wider educational gap than before, and many may not be able to resume their educational plan path. At this point, let me add a huge problem for persons that are blind. There, the, any accessibility? Luisa, on, yes. Sorry to interrupt. If you could start to to summarize or or bring the main points you had towards the end, that would be wonderful. I'm very sorry. And by the way, the yes. sound quality was our problem, not yes. yours. But it's been sorted yes. out. We hear you perfectly now. Okay. So uh, no accessibility for blind person. No access, accessible format, no sign language for deaf people that not use it and not subtitle and no digital accessibility. Uh, the work, another, another problem is the, the, the deployment services. We need to protect the workplaces of workers with disability. We must secure the job in the form that are now possible. And we must take into account the, an answer to the need of a worker that have in charge a family member with disability. Uh, we are really worried about the post-COVID period. Disability services will need a lot of funding and support if they are to even survive. I am not even talking about driving. We are worried that the national authority will cut even more funding, and we are worried that EU funding will be diverted away from services and disability organizations. We cannot allow this to happen. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Louisa. And now I would like to give the floor to our board member from Denmark, Thorkild Ulsson, who will speak about the role of dis disabled people's organizations. Thorkild, can we hear your voice there? I guess you can. I hope you can. Perfectly, perfectly. I give you the floor. <laughs> I will avoid uh, using the camera uh, as uh, you will concentrate more on my words when there's no picture of me, I guess. Um, First of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak about the role of uh, disabled people's organization in this pandemic. Uh, and I will start by saying that I am extremely proud to be a member of an organization, of a movement across Europe, who has been a real important tool for, uh, uh, for both the, uh, the We lost you there, actually, Thorkild. We heard you perfectly, but then we lost you. The, the, uh, the There's a little bit of a disconnection. We were hearing you perfectly. Raquel, do you have any suggestion? Uh, first of all, um, sorry. Great, we can hear uh, you again. Sorry. No, uh, okay. First of all, the advocacy work we have been doing this pandemic was, of course, not uh, seen by foreseen by anyone. So the problem that we have, have been run into is, as it has been mentioned, uh, we have been very much uh, uh, advocating around Europe for measures in accessibility. For persons who are deaf, uh, it has been uh, really uh, important to have sign language, but no countries were ready with sign, lang sign language uh, in, in, uh, around information and information meetings, press release and so on uh, in the start of this uh, pandemic. Uh, there, there has been quite a lot of problems with the, um, the uh, information phones uh, who has been put up uh, for example, in uh, Portugal, the situation just has been solved last week. 
so deaf persons can use the information flows about the pandemic. We have also uh, had quite a lot to do in trying to uh, to uh, help with the consequences of the fast shutdown of the societies that was made. We have had uh, problems with institutions who were shut down and where it has been quite problematic uh, and has been a, a, a really a help matter for our members that they are mentally and physically uh, in, a, some, in some ways they have felt very hard that the, the situation has been shut down. So this is also something we have dealt with very uh, much. And on the other side, we have had quite a lot of work to do in service providing. Our member organizations have uh, been uh, working in trying to help with food, medicine, uh, and all other sorts of help uh, in basic help to members of our organizations. Help that we have not been used to and that has strain, uh, been a strain to the organizations. I think that it is very important at this, at this moment to say uh, and to agree with our president that it has been very strainful for our organizations in logistics and in an economic situation. Uh, only this week we have heard from our Latvian uh, organization, member organization, like the Council of Persons with Disabilities of Latvia, that they have had to fire the, some of the staff because structural funding has been held back. Uh, and therefore, they, they are now uh, skipping off uh, persons. In other, other countries, the same situation is the strain is very high on the costs and the funding of the organizations. And we have to also say that the involvement uh, as provided at, in the CRPD has been very poor. So now, when we hopefully, uh, we hope, uh, in Denmark at least, I think we hope all over Europe, we are on the downhill uh, from this, uh, from the high point of this pandemic. We will very much urge that, for the first, firstly, that organizations of persons with disabilities are in the work from the start of in this reopening of the societies. We have a good example from Italy, where our colleague Gian Grifo, uh, Gian Piero Grifo, is a part of the task force uh, in Italy, who's reopening the society. In Denmark, uh, my organization, Disabled People's Organization, Denmark has received uh, around 3 million uh, euros from our uh, governments uh, to try to help reopening the system. And we are part of the, the partnership. So we have to, um, we have to uh, say that that's the, the, the good stories, but we have to have more good stories on inclusion and involvement. And the second uh, is the funding stop quarreling about funds we have to use them now so please politicians go home to your countries and say that we need the money go home to uh, your friends in the back uh, uh, background in your countries and urge them to support organizations of persons with disabilities and to uh, the commissioner we also need to uh, to see on the funding of the organizations of persons with disabilities in europe this is very extreme and we are very extremely hard pressured uh, on this. So please, I urge you, do something about it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thorkeld. Um, could I give the floor now to Mr. Albert Prevot, who's also our executive committee member and calling in to us from France. Albert, you have the floor. Thank you, Catherine. Do you hear me? Perfectly. Okay, good afternoon uh, to everyone. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. I'm very honored to participate in this meeting and, and I thank you for inviting me. I will briefly give some examples on how lockdown measures in Europe have impacted persons with disabilities. My first point is about continuity of care. My colleague Luisa, last moment, already explained the conditions that are imposed to persons in residential institution in some countries, not all countries, of course. I just want to, to put a stress on people with disabilities when they live in their own house, alone or with their families, who can no longer benefit from home health, no continuity of essential care. Lockdown has often resulted in depriving people with disabilities of the recurrent care they need and which remains necessary for their health and that of their families. 
several DPOs in my country, but in many other countries, have had the, to organize home visits to avoid the exhaustion of families and to break isolation of people with disabilities. My second point is about access to goods and services. Lockdowns in many countries are exacerbating problems in accessing goods and services. Of course, persons with disabilities had already before the pandemic more difficulty to access them due to accessibility barriers. However, that problem exacerbated. It is not only because they cannot go outside in order to protect themselves, often because of lack of protective e equipment, particularly necessary for them. It is that delivery services, for example, are overwhelmed and stop delivering. Persons in their support network who could usually bring them goods and services cannot come anymore. Of course, we do welcome the increased solidarity displayed by countless people all over the EU, but we need now more sustainable solutions, such as priority delivery, food and support aid from authorities and accessible contact points to request help. My third point is about some cases of harassment. In some countries, not all, it took time for authorities to recognize that persons with certain type of disabilities, such as persons with intellectual disabilities, with psychosocial disabilities, autistic people, or persons with mental health issues were not able to withstand the very harsh confinement measures that were imposed. In Italy, in Spain, in my country, in France, governments relaxed the measures, but only after outcry from DPOs and media pressure. I must add, with a little shame, that this, however, created a problem of harassment of persons with disabilities, because some people thought they were breaking the rule. The problem was and is widespread, as we must know that. My first point is about information. We have also to ensure the continuity and effectiveness of people's rights. It has been said, an important issue about information, about providing information accessible to all people with disabilities. I mean, information for people with disabilities and we had to develop adapted communication tools very quickly, but also about people with disabilities. For instance, we heard being stopped by of workers, being stopped by police, because police didn't understand that a client's home is a place of work. In some countries where you need administrative forms to go out, such as my own country, and I think in Romania, Organizations of persons with disabilities had to create accessible versions of the forms so blind and partially sighted persons could fill it. Well, I, I have my next point. I will be very short because the time is is not a long time. It will be uh, short because it, it has been mentioned. I mean about education, but we have a special concern about education. There is still great uncertainty about the conditions of schooling for children with disabilities at home. Lockdown keeps them away from personal assistance and sometimes from a safe environment. It also increases the digital gap for those who add, who add social vulnerability to their disability. And the last point, of course, is about the conditions of hospitalization. Disability must not be a criterion for refusing care, whether we are talking about simple hospitalization or resuscitation. This is very important at the, on the arrival at the emergency room in hospitals. Finally, we can say the early involvement of organizations of persons with disabilities could have avoided most of these difficulties. It is therefore very important, it will be my conclusion, I think, that the DPOs be clearly involved 
in the gradual phase out of people with disabilities from lockdown. Thank you. Thank you so much, Albert. And now I would like our final speaker from the disability movement before we give the floor to Commissioner Daly will be Dovile Yudgete, who is our board member from Lithuania. Dovile, you can also turn on your um, video if you like, or just use the microphone, whichever you want, because actually our, our sound problem is resolved. So you're very nice to see you. Thank you so much. Greetings to everyone. Do you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. Uh, I would like to really thank you for inviting me and making the contribution on behalf of the European Disability Forum here in this very important meeting. And as my colleagues already said, the European Disability Forum and organizations of persons with disabilities uh, Europe-wide is uh, generally very extremely worried about the post-COVID period. And one of the main concerns is related to funding. Funding for social protection for persons with disabilities, funding for support services in the community, and funding for the organizations of persons with disabilities. The toll that the last economic crisis took is not only fresh in our memory, but also something that many persons with disabilities still live with. We are worried that funds will be cut, we are worried that funds will be diverted, and we are worried that EU funding that would have been used to support social inclusion and actually social justice of persons with disabilities will be now allocated to other actions. New flexibility in the rules governing the use of structural funds and state aid should not result in less money for persons with disabilities. We are also worried that measures governments are taking to ensure liquidity for businesses do not reach and extend to disability services. This may mean that many will close even if funding is available for them at a later, later stage. We are also afraid that efforts to cut costs will reverse the process of deinstitutionalization. It is necessary to guarantee funding for the transition from institutional to community-based services, since we have seen the harm of institutionalizing people is very clearly perfectly displayed during this COVID crisis. It is unacceptable, that is why institutions are created or given resources to continue after this crisis. We need strong financial measures, financial measure, measures that directly support persons with disabilities in the community. We need to avoid a repetition of the previous crisis where persons with disabilities were excluded and unsupported. Persons with disabilities are still suffering because of the last crisis. According to our recently launched fourth human rights report on poverty and social exclusion, almost 30% of persons with disabilities in the EU were at risk of poverty before this crisis. 43% in my own country, Lithuania. And the situation was worsening since 2010 in 11 EU countries, Estonia, Luxembourg, Germany, Sweden, Ireland, Czech Republic, Lithuania, Italy, Netherlands, Malta and Spain. And in the countries where conditions improved, it took far longer to improve conditions for persons with disabilities. If the situation was already serious a few months ago, imagine how it is now and how it will be after this crisis if governments do not act. We need measures that include direct support such as lump sum payments, tax relief measures, subsidization of goods and expenses, automatic extension of disability related entitlements, cash transfer. We need to ensure these supports reach all persons with disabilities. We need to also count and we need to know the impact of this crisis on persons with disabilities. Too many had to suffer alone, ignored, isolated. Too many were discriminated against. Too many died and are still dying. 
We need data, concrete and systematic information on how COVID-19 impacted persons with disabilities. And as many of my colleagues said already, we need to be involved and have to have resources to be sustainably and effectively involved. We need to be in the task forces, in the expert committees, the virtual meetings that will decide on the measures taken. We need funding to do so. And the next months will be very crucial for all those matters. So we cannot be left behind. We need to participate because nothing about is without us. Thank you for listening. Thank you so very much, uh, Dovile. So now we are going to hear from uh, Commissioner Daly, who is, as you all know, the first European Commissioner for Equality. We're so honoured to have her with us here today. We did not expect that the first participation of Commissioner Daly in a disability intergroup meeting would be online, but we really appreciate uh, her time in accepting the invitation to speak to us today. Commissioner Daly, you're extremely welcome if you want to put on your camera. I want to just mention as you're putting your camera on some questions which came in the chat box which haven't been mentioned now, such as the situation of people with disabilities in COVID-19 outside of Europe. This is one issue that's been brought up. So, Commissioner, are you ready to address us? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Would you like to put your video on or do I you... have. Oh, I, have. I wonder, I don't see you. I'm seeing myself now, so... Uh... Let me see. We'll just wait for a moment to see uh -huh. if we can see yeah, you, because that would be wonderful. I think it would be good if we could see you. Yeah. I'll see if we can do Share something. Share my webcam a moment. I think now. Oh, perfect. Wonderful. Okay. Yes, we can see you. Thank you. <laughs> I turn off my microphone now. Thank you so much. Okay. So, dear friends and honourable members of Parliament, I really wish to thank you for for organizing this exercise, this enriching exercise, I must say, whereby we can all listen to one another and, and come closer to the various different realities of people with disabilities and older people during this pandemic, and whereby we can discuss and propose more solutions. So thank you very much for organizing this. Persons with disabilities as well as older persons are experiencing extremely difficult situations in residential care. Many others have lost their lives due to this devastating pandemic as we have been hearing. So health and social workers keep on working with total dedication under extremely demanding circumstances. So the EU's implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has been put to the test and becomes even more relevant in this crisis situation. It is essential that the EU and its member state continue to respect the commitments undertaken when ratifying the UN Convention, notably the right to the accessibility of the highest attainable standard of health without discrimination on the basis of disability or age. At the top of the agenda for the European Commission is safeguarding the, the health and well-being of citizens. So we have reacted quickly and put in place several measures in the area of health policy to tackle the current crisis. This includes ensuring sufficient medical supplies and protective equipment. Thus, the Commission launched four calls for tender to ensure equipment for member states. It also published guidance on how to use the flexibilities under the EU public procurement framework. Furthermore, 
the relevant harmonized standards are freely available to companies with the aim to manufacture personal protective equipment of required high quality. To facilitate the identification of available supplies and match them with member states' demands, the Commission has also put in place a clearinghouse for medical equipment. Moreover, the Commission approved temporarily waiving customs duties and VAT on the import of medical devices and protective equipment from third countries. All of these supplies and equipment are commodities like any other, and they obviously need to be paid for. So the European Commission has come forward to help ease the financial burden that this crisis is causing. At the beginning of April, the Commission launched the EU Solidarity for Health initiative to support the healthcare systems of member states. It provides 6 billion euros for purchasing emergency support. The Commission carried out an in-depth analysis of the EU funds, including remaining European structural and investment funds. The Coronavirus Response Investment Initiative packages of measures provides the member states with more flexibility to use EU funds to counter the effects of this crisis. But all these available resources will not help if they are not properly targeted. This can only be achieved with effective and inclusive social protection systems. These are essential for guaranteeing an adequate standard of living for persons with disabilities. Indeed, in spite of the heavy impact on those systems by the COVID crisis, we cannot lower our standards in Europe. Social protection and inclusion are at the core of the European pillar of social rights. We must ensure that unprecedented challenges posed by the COVID crisis are duly considered in order to make our social protection systems fit for the future. The European pillar of social rights will remain the compass for upward convergence, even more so in times of crisis. Its principles, and in particular those of its third chapter, social protection and social inclusion, should be at the heart of our response to social challenges in the EU. The European semester continues to be the main vehicle for monitoring the implementation of the European pillar agenda. We are making sure that member states take into account the fact that persons with disabilities are among the groups particularly affected by COVID-19 and have access to medical and social care on equal basis with others. Confinement measures have put enormous pressure on school communities across the EU. As the learning process is primary, primarily taking place virtually, learners with disabilities encounter barriers which can negatively affect their learning development and results. So lack of accessibility increases the exclusion of students with disabilities. Parents of children with disabilities in the absence of support are experiencing additional difficulties in finding the balance between their working commitments while supporting their children's learning process. I therefore urge you to continue conveying the message to governments to consider the additional burden and challenges 
imposed on learners with disabilities and on their families. I invite the national authorities and the relevant stakeholders to adopt measures to prevent learners with disabilities and their families having to face additional discrimination resulting from the current crisis. Remote education must also be accessible to all learners with disabilities. Sign interpretation, live captioning, adapted learning processes or any other measures should become available in close consultation with learners with disabilities and their families. Persons with disabilities in residential settings are, of course, of very big concern to us. COVID-19 is hitting them more than any other group. Social isolation measures, the risk of infection for both care professionals and persons with disabilities, together with the limited availability of protected material, create additional challenges. Those challenges can even lead to institutionalization of persons with disabilities who were, until now, living in their communities. I stress that persons with disabilities should not be institutionalized because of quarantine procedures beyond the minimum necessary to overcome the stage of their illness. And those who were in institutional care before COVID are fully entitled to receive the care which they need. The current situation puts enormous challenges on the provisions of services to persons with disabilities in institutional care. Yesterday, together with Vice President Suica and Commissioners Kiriakidis and Schmidt, we discussed with support care service providers and organizations, including the European Disability Forum, some of those challenges. Member States must make funding and practical solutions available to ensure that persons with disabilities are not negatively affected by the temporary loss of support networks due to illness or the indirect impact of COVID-19. This includes personal assistance, family and specific professional services. With the ban of visits to care facilities and social distancing, persons who are already isolated are among those who are the most impacted. Nobody should le be left without support and essential services, including access to emergency and intensive care. So we must ensure that no one, but no one is left behind. We should keep in mind that crisis and confinement measures can deteriorate, deteriorate mental health and generate fear and anxiety. Therefore, we should invest more in reaching out. We should not forget that solidarity and community support are important for all, but in particular for the most vulnerable amongst us. For our part in the European Commission, we are making efforts to communicate all these aspects and measures to the public in Europe. Of course, we need to make sure that our messages reach persons with disabilities. Our website is accessible as are the documents and published messages. Furthermore, we have increased the number of video messages with subtitles and sign language interpretation. My aim is to have our communications accessible from the start and thus avoid making them accessible at a later stage. This is an obligation for all EU institutions. We are also passing the message to the member states. In our recommendation on mobile ac applications, accessibility for persons with disability is clearly included. 
I have written to all equality ministers in member states, highlighting issues concerning people with disabilities and old people. And we are now following up with every member state. We have to learn from the dramatic experience that this crisis has brought to the EU. And we have to apply what we have learned. The new strengthened European disability strategy that underpins our implementation of the UN Convention is currently under preparation, as you all know. It will take into account the challenges arising from the COVID crisis and its devastating economic and social consequences. So we must avoid a deterioration of social networks and prevent further inequalities for persons with disabilities. To this end, I will keep my commitment to continue to be in contact with organizations representing persons with disabilities to identify complementary, concrete measures the EU can take for a collective and social response to COVID. We will continue to consult all relevant stakeholders in order to ensure comprehensive and effective EU action in the field of disability. In the current circumstances, it is of the essence that we put in place a solid framework for the coming years to ensure that no one is left behind. I thank you. Thank you so much for your participation and for your speech, uh, Commissioner. I would like to let everybody know that we will, because we started late, we have permission from our service providers like our captioner and Gerdinand, who you see there interpreting and Lisa, to go over time today because we started late. So it will be possible for you to hear all of the inputs from members of parliament that are going to participate now. And with that, I hand the floor to MEP uh, Dragos Bislaru, who will give us an introduction to the role of the parliament in general, before various members of parliament will also make interventions. I give you the floor. Thank you so much, Dragos. I will start with probably what is uh, mostly heard right now in the calls. Do you hear me? Really perfectly, and we see you as well. Good, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you for the invite. It's, it's a, a really an honor. Um, dear colleagues, dear Commissioner for Equality, Elena Dali, dear members of the EDF, I'm really glad and honored to be here today with you and to have this opportunity to speak with you. The COVID-19 outbreak has hit the European society hard and its effects have an impact not only on the health of Europeans, but also on their way of life, on their personal income, on savings, jobs, while also causing concerns about the future prospects of each of us. It is a period of concern, of anguish, of having the life of the people at stake. As members of the European Parliament, we do have the duty to make the voices of European citizens heard, including and probably prioritizing the voices of those who have been less heard, persons with disabilities. It is therefore my honor and my responsibility to be a member of the Disability Intergroup Bureau and have the opportunity to listen not only today uh, to your experiences, your best practices and your demands. I am actually learning from you and I'm just a vessel, a channel to, to make your voices be heard wider in Europe. This year, just before the crisis, we had a really strong start in the European Parliament by adopting the resolution on the European Disability Strategy post-2020. There was a strong political consensus for supporting that resolution and I'm really glad about it. It was a good feeling and we were actually starting quite well this particular mandate. But uh, alas, with no doubt, the pandemic has made a reset to the priorities of the European Parliament and now all the committees are taking duly account of the emergencies that the current crisis imposes on us. Thus, in our range of competencies as co-legislators, 
and as representatives of EU citizens, we aim at adopting the changes that are also generating the changes needed in the mechanism and instruments provided by other institutions such as the Council and the Commission. On April 17, the plenary of the European Parliament has adopted an important resolution on an EU coordinated action to combat the COVID-19 pandemic and its consequences. I just need to say that I'm proud to be part of Vini Europe as the group calling for that plenary session to happen at the forefront of proposing and negotiating this resolution. It is very important for us to show that even during such times we can serve together with the other political groups together the interest of the European citizens. We called in that particular resolution for a massive recovery and reconstruction package, including recovery bonds, guarantees, uh, unemployment reinsurance schemes, um, EU coronavirus solidarity fund of, of at least 50 billion euros, and greater powers for the EU to act in the case of cross-border health threats, threats like the COVID-19. In this resolution, we did raise strongly the demands of the disability movement we called the Commission and the Member States to prioritize persons with disabilities. We also reminded them of their obligation of involving persons with disabilities to their representative organization in all the measures affecting them, living up this way to the UN Convention of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and to the motto of persons with disabilities, nothing about you without you. Furthermore, we insisted twice in paragraphs 13 and 36 of this resolution that the EU and the Member States should give particular attention to equal access to health care to persons with disabilities and ensure that community-based care and support services needed by these persons on a daily basis are well-funded and well-equipped and staffed. This, this is exactly the response to concerns that have been vividly expressed here and are quite worryingly still happening in the member states. Besides this resolution, one of the most important measures of, that the parliament agreed upon is funding to tackle the crisis. Here, Commissioner Dali has already mentioned the moves and the steps done by the commission. The parliament has approved this Corona uh, Response Initiative, initiative uh, Investment Initiative Plus. This brings more flexibility to cohesion funds, the European Social Fund. This is actually allowing EU funds to be used with a co-financing rate of 100% in programs that tackle COVID-19. Organizations working with persons with disabilities and applying to EU funds to cope with the pandemic will be able to access these funds more easily and with lighter audit requirements. I've heard actually before um, the speakers mentioning the fact that flexibility can be seen um, as having both a good part and a bad part. The bad part would be that money can be taken out from the spectrum of helping organizations uh, catering the needs of people, the persons with disabilities. But the good part is that we have right now flexibility to bring more resources in this particular field and taking care of the most vulnerable. Indeed, uh, it's up to the, to the governments of the member states and the, at the EU level what we can do is to monitor and highlight if this is not going towards the vulnerable people, towards the persons with disability. When it comes, for example, to the fund of European aid for the most deprived, where I was a shadow rapporteur for in Europe, we adopted measures including the possibility to finance this provision of protected equipment for workers and volunteers uh, to provision the, to, to have to purchase vouchers and cards that can actually be used to, to buy food and basic materials, reducing the risk of contamination, all things related to support and care services for persons with disabilities um, that can actually be used and benefit from these measures. Um, I think that um, to, to, to add to the general hope that this extra funding that we have provided will ensure that uh, the uh, healthcare coverage reaches everyone without any type of discrimination against persons with disabilities, so they will also receive the care that they need. I'm really glad to follow Commissioner Dali and I hope that she will actually answer um, the invite of AMPL as a committee to participate um, in a public hearing later on when her time will allow to about how equality will be preserved in the recovery plans put forward by the Commission that we are all waiting to see how they will going to be developed and implemented. 
in this unprecedented crisis, we truly need to hear not only the Commission and the Council, but the organization like the Dis European Disability Forum and its members to ensure that all the voices, concern and ideas, such as the ones mentioned today, are heard. Because from this crisis, we can only leave, it, we can actually leave it behind only if we do it together. Unfortunately, the pandemic has shown us once again that people in vulnerable groups are so much more exposed to socioeconomic effects and discrimination in terms of access to health care rather than the rest of the population. Residential and care centers for people with disabilities especially have become outbreaks of infection. People with disabilities dependent on caregivers have been deprived of these services and isolation has, been, has made it difficult for them to access rehabilitation treatments um, or basic services. I have seen dire figures from centers in my home country, and this was actually mentioned today, the Saskanak example of Romania, both patients and caregivers are affecting staggering amounts. We are fighting to raise the issue and awareness of the needs of people with disabilities in order for them to receive the adequate care and resources they need. These are all real problems in our communities that we need to assume and fight to get the level needed to combat them. But this is, this is also important to think about the future, about, about what we can do, the lessons we have learned, we have a little, sorry Dragos, we have a little issue now with your sound. It was perfect for a while. Okay, can you hear right now? There's some kind of interference. I think it's not just me because I see Gardenand has a little trouble with it. It was perfect for a while, but just there. Okay, okay. Um, um, I, 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 I wonder what it is. Can you hear me right now? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So um, to be able to to to, to conclude, actually, um, so I was saying that all these uh, problems that I've been mentioning are real problems in our communities that we need to assume and find together the levers needed to combat them. But it's also important to think about the future and the lessons we've learned from the crisis to be stronger and more determined in terms of access and opportunities we offer to persons with disabilities. From the disability intergroup, we will remain vigilant and active in ensuring that no decision forgets persons with disabilities as well as their families and support and care services. And to do so, we remain at your disposal to bring up your proposal and demands whenever needed in the parliament with the colleagues that we have together. Thank you very much for your attention and many thanks to the European Disability Forum and the other colleagues for organizing this meeting and for all your activities during this period. I hope we will have the, to, the opportunity to see each other soon in good health. Thank you and I wish you all luck in all the efforts that we are actually doing together throughout Europe for the persons with disabilities. Thank you so much. So now we have a session with uh, sh very short interventions from a number of MEPs. We have collected some questions in the question box. There will be a chance for you all to hear responses from the Commissioner for Equality or from other MEPs if you target specific questions to them. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. I would give the floor now to MEP Anne-Sophie Pelletier, if you would like to turn on your mic so we can hear you. Um, it's okay for you? Perfect. Thank you. So thank you very much for this uh, very good initiative. I just want to, to make a, a, a short point because, you know, in France, uh, we have had 234 deaths uh, of, people, of people with disability. And we have had so many professionals who have uh, suspect to be infected by the COVID. Um, I think there was so many problems. The first problem is that it was the protection of personnel. Because, you know, in France, um, the protection provided by the regional health agency, and it was too long to arrive and to take care about people with disability and to protect them, them, themselves. Um, and the protection, uh, most especially lack of masks was very important and hydrochloric gel lack too. Um, protective glasses no nothing so it's um 
it's very a disaster because you know if you don't have the protection to take care about people um we see that in france we have had 600 uh, 6000 sorry 6588 people uh, who can be suspected i want to to say that um the confinement had um um repercussion about uh, people with disability because um the confinement and the absence of the protection leads um take a suspend a suspension of um many many number of treatments i want to think about uh physiotherapists psychologists speech therapists um you know it's very um I don't know what will be happen after, but I think we would have too many to do because uh, we can we can speak about uh, disability, but I think about the family because the family was alone, alone to take care about um, the parents, and um, it was it was so difficult to be to be alone for them. I just want to end in the positive note because. Uh, what I say, it's not very, very, very well, but um, I think that uh, people with disability have so many resources because um, in, in establishment, special establishment for people with disabilities, they continue to work and they continue to work um, when they do uh, some mask uh, per day, I think about uh, about this establishment in Vesoul on the up, they do uh, 10,000 masks per, per day. And uh, you, we can do so many initiatives uh, where people with disability was very solidar, um, was with, with solidarity. And um, I think that this initiative will, will, will uh, where so so positive and we see that um, one more time um there are many 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 resources to thank be you in the solidarity so thank you very much sorry for my english sorry sorry but, your but, english uh, is beautiful thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you i would like to give the floor now to um one of the chairs of our disability intergroup uh, Ms. Radka Maxova. We're just waiting to see or to hear you. Beautiful, Hello? we can see you. Yes, okay. and we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much for organizing this webinar. I think it's very helpful because we can share our experience with COVID and we can um, help with uh, plan for the future measures. Um, distinguished uh, ladies, men and colleagues, uh, naturally the main focus uh, of the current crisis management force is on health cares. However, informal care has been once again outside the center of attention. I would therefore like to stress that it is essential to adapt measures to support informal carriers who take responsibility for the care needs of their relative with disabilities. Failing to do so could lead to losses of life. In the Czech Republic, about 200 250,000 people are in home care and for about a third of them, construction of COVID-19 would be fatal. Uh, and yet persons in home care are basically not including in any system of allocation of protective equipment, nor they are accounted for the crisis planning. Uh, this is simply not acceptable. Uh, it is true that the situation differs from uh, one member state to another. Uh, yet, generally speaking, the support provided to informal carriers remains largely insufficient and fragmented. Uh, we need to push for the support to informal carriers to be mainstreamed in all relevant EU anti-crisis measures 
and the reform, the use of all EU funding instruments like ECF, ERDF, ECIF at national level should be aligned with this. Furthermore, as the majority of uh, informal careers are women, support and recognition of informal careers uh, would uh, contribute to mitigate the negative impact of the current crisis on gender equality. Uh, I am therefore pleased uh, that the text called Renew Europe's uh, 11 commitments for the person with disabilities that is um, I initiated uh, does pay attention to the informal careers, uh, also rather in long term, and that it commits to ensuring swift transposition and implementation of the directive on work-life balance for parents and careers in all the member states. Uh, on a different note, I will also mention that I uh, intended to send a question to the Commission and the Council concerning the establishment of disability focal points, so you might receive an email for potential co-signature in the beginning of the next week. Um, thank you very much again for this discussion and uh, be health and take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Maxova. And now I would like to give the floor to our next uh, bureau member, actually from the Disability Intergroup, uh, coming to us from Spain, Ms. Monica Silvana Gonzalez. Um, I would just wait to see you put your mic on or your camera so we can see you if you're there. Can you hear me? Now I can hear you, yes. Can you speak again? Can you um, just take the mic again? There is a little, I think there was a little bit of an issue um, because perhaps you might be logged in twice. Perhaps that's why there's some interference. Raquel, can I ask you to help with this? Yeah, sure. Uh, but I think you need to uh, give the floor to Stelios and I'm going to uh, take this with uh, Monica very quickly. Wonderful. Monica, we'll come directly back to you. We just need to sort out so you're in there once and then the sound will be very good and everyone will be able to hear you well. So if you're um, ready, we would give the floor to MEP uh, Stelios Kimporopoulos, coming to us, I believe, from uh, from Greece. Or I'm not sure if you're in Brussels. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Hello, okay, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, honorable Commissioner, dear colleagues, uh, dear guests, uh, dear organizers, I would like uh, sincerely to thank you for this uh, beautiful uh, uh, webinar, which is uh, uh, accessible for everyone. Uh, I think that we have heard uh, very good uh, presentations from the uh, speakers before, but uh, I have uh, I, I want to make a, a point that I feel some, somehow sad that uh, some of us they still believe that uh, institutions are acceptable. And uh, I'll, say, I'll say that because I need to say something from my uh, own perspective. I have been uh, trying uh, for a while to find the number of the European disabled citizens. So I asked Eurostand and I got a nice email back informing me that the data, if, uh, the data it provides concerning disabled people does not count people in institutions or collective households. So I cannot stress this enough. Let's make the people count. Following the lockdown, the, the institutionalization must continue. So, Mrs. Uh, Commissioner, please keep in your plans to inform us 
about the Commission's strategy on the digitalization, many of us asked in the December's plenary. The second point is that during the lockdown, I tabled with many of uh, you colleagues three written questions related more or less to disabled uh, and COVID cases. Some of us can have some treatment online. So progressive on telemedicine can be applied. It is important to avoid uh, going to the hospital. For some, the lack of treatment means steps back. Some say years back. So I would like your view whether we should address this issue jointly. A second, my, my third and last point is a non-contemporary but all-time classic subject of disability. An advertisement in Greece appeared with the following plot. Before I was happy, I had friends, a girlfriend, a career. Then I had a car accident and now I'm disabled. Therefore, I'm unhappy. This does not shape the social position of the disabled people. And I would like your view on disabled, on how disabled uh, in the media should be dealt. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for your intervention. And I will move on. It's, it's wonderful to have all the MEPs giving um, their interventions. I apologize to everyone if we have little delays in between. Um, could I now come back to our co-chair again, Ms. Monica Silvana Gonzalez, uh, to see if your sound is working okay? Can you speak? I saw. If you just uh, put on your mic, click on the microphone. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Technical Service for making this meeting uh, possible. Uh, thank you a lot to ADF team for uh, pushing uh, the meeting with uh, Mrs. Uh, Dali, uh, who I also thank for her attention and support in today's session. Uh, we understand the difficult uh, position. Uh, she has uh, sensibilized uh, other commis commissioners uh, who are the chain of disability issue. Uh, in the resolution approved the uh, last plenary session, we are including people with disability, but uh, we would, uh, would have a like to see more concrete points regarding the sector. Uh, however, we shall take that resolution as a why uh, for the construction we, we will need after the global pandemic COVID-19. Uh, there is a note that Europe is responding to the whole crisis, but a more inclusive answer in terms of disability in all need because of the great impact uh, that it is the making in the in the co collective. Uh, that is uh, why the so be also included uh, in the recovery plan that uh, is being designing. So I, uh, I suggest uh, considering the importance of the next point and taking them in account to guarantee the availability uh, of information uh, in a simple language uh, and easy to understand them, as well as the simple access to uh, this information, automatic telephonic service without depending on website uh, ATC. Um, it is a compulsory the no discrimination of the person with disability in the medical service. service. Uh, there is a clear ethnic uh, white lie uh, about this. Uh, more, moreover, the authority have the duty of carry out the convention about the person with disability right of the UNO, especially the Article 11 resituation and humanitarian emergencies. 
uh, in the, in in addition, uh, they must follow in the existing good practice uh, showed uh, showed us. A uh, the treatment priority, priorities like the victim selection. Remember the fundamental ethnic ethic principle uh, that obliges the medical staff to ensure a correct triage triage application using the resourcing in the better way. Any other selection criteria would be unacceptable and could be considered a human right violation. Uh, the support uh, program for people with disabilities show necessary have a gender scope due to the violence against women and the, ch and the child in crime during uh, the lockdown measure. Uh, more found uh, are needed uh, for the provision of uh, service and support. The European solidarity is compulsory to ensure strong essential service. The implication of the people of the person with disability through their representative organization because they are the ones who can provide better advice to the authority about how they can proceed. Uh, she she sole guarantee the marginalized and in solidar people keep their support, good and human essential contacts. Support network and assistant dispositive in terms of economic health to ensure the people with disabilities still have their essential staff. We should guarantee unemployment, ensure us schismes uh, and protect minimum income. Among uh, other measures, should as a fiscal benefit and flexibility for payment and teleworking. Uh, otherwise, we must ensure measure to guarantee the uh, 100 uh, percent of salary for workers. Uh, it must be uh, underlined in the EU recovery plan uh, essential attention to the recovery of the special job or adaptive, adaptive jobs to ensure uh, the non-national protection for the United Nations so the state member shall give a correct attention without any uh, discrimination for nationality reason. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, but my English very, very bad, but I try to speak in English uh, and I hope uh, you all understand. Thank you. Thank you very much and special thank you for the commissioner uh, Lena Dali. Can Thank you, you very much. Yes, I just want to interrupt slightly the inputs that we have from uh, members of the European Parliament because I need to give the floor, because of the timing of our meeting, I need to give the floor to uh, the Commissioner for Equality, Commissioner Daly, to respond to some of the issues which have been raised because within 10 minutes she will need to leave. So I, I am sorry that I, I break up the rhythm of, of the inputs at the moment. So um, I'm can just you hear ask, me? Yes, I can hear you. I cannot see you yet. OK, let's try. Uh, share my webcam. Can you see me now? Yes, I can see you. And just to let everybody know, if more questions come in that are addressed towards the Commission after the Commissioner leaves, she has colleagues in the services who are also attending, we will take note of the questions and we can actually um, find responses later in case there's an issue with timing. So I give you the floor. Thank you very yes. much, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you so much. Actually, I scheduled until 5.30. And then at 5.35, I have to go into another meeting. So I'm sorry that um, uh, I had to disturb you in, in, in this way. Um, so, so thank you all for, for your contributions. And we have listened carefully and we have also um, taken note of all that was said so that we can work on it. And I, I reiterate uh, my call that my door is always open and this is an ongoing conversation. It doesn't start or stop 
Pierre, I, I had said at the very beginning that I want this uh, to be ongoing because, because realities change, situations change, and it's very good that we have this dialogue between us, between parliament, between civil society, going on all the time. Um, Mr. Drago said that he would, uh, he's going to invite me for, for some uh, event of theirs, uh, organized by Ampel, uh, of course, um, provided that my diary isn't already booked, I will, I will gladly attend. Um, Madame Maxova spoke about the establishment of a disability focal point. Uh, I'll wait for her letter to see exactly what she means by that, because I want to draw your attention that uh, I'm sure that you all know that we have set up a task force whereby uh, a person, uh, an expert on equality, is working in every DG, okay, so that the equality perspective is taken in on all policy and legislation which is being formulated so at the very early stage so there is that uh, perspective there uh, and and this task force is, is is working and obviously the disability perspective is introduced into whatever it is that the commission is is doing so uh, we i'll have to see with uh, Madame Maxova, what, what uh, she actually has uh, in mind. I, I don't think that there were other concrete questions, or maybe so, because sometimes the audio wasn't very, very clear. But uh, as you said, uh, Chair, um, I'd be very, very um, happy to to um, follow up on whatever questions there 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 might be, or maybe on questions I might have have missed while I was listening in, uh, as I said, because it wasn't always um, very, very clear. But uh, um, thank you for this. And, and this will inform our work. Okay, so, so, so please, let's, let's keep this dialogue uh, going and, and uh, keep, keep giving us your critique, because that is how we, we grow together, how we learn together, and how we will be effective to the people we are working for, to the people you are representing. So thank you very much for this. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you so much again for joining us. And as I, I said before, we will take note of any other questions that come and make sure that they're communicated to your um, to your team and your staff to, to see what kind of questions need to be followed up and answered. And we really appreciate your participation today. Thank you. So now um, I would like to give the floor to another chair of our disability intergroup, uh, Ms. Katrin Langensiepen. Um, you're very welcome to put on your microphone or your camera. Uh, I think the sound is working well enough for us to handle the cameras as well. It's nice for people to see you if that's okay for you. Beautiful, we can see you. Hello, can you hear me? Can hear you very well as well. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thanks uh, to Helena for your uh, report. It was uh, great to hear you. And all my colleagues, uh, thanks to Dragos um, and all of the NGOs and, and people who are involved in our issue, people with disabilities. I would like to express my gratitude, of course, to, to all um, uh, the organizations. And um, I know that the Commission did an external evaluation of the present European Union disability strategy in March this year and that they are preparing also an internal evaluation on the basis of which the new post-2020 EU disability strategy will be drafted. Um, I hope that the evaluation we also cover the experience of the pandemic and appropriate measures will be pro proposed in the post-2020 disability strategy which I very much hope will be prepared on the basic of systemic 
consultations with organizations representing persons with disabilities as they uh, are the ones who work in the field and know the gravest challenges. Um, I was looking for the post-2020 European Union disability strategy and the leaked version of the Commission re revised work program two weeks ago, a uh, program for 2020, but couldn't find it. So where is the disability strategy post-2020? Could you ensure us, dear Helena Daly, or people who are in, in charge, that the strategy be on the agenda for 2020? I know many strategies are in, but from my perspective and my info is that the people with disabilities, the strategy is not in. Um, what little time is enough to give up the values that we have fought for, such as equality and non-discrimination and arrive at triage, which are violating our human rights, uh, people who are speaking before me mention it already, thanks for that. I have organized two webinars here in Germany recently to draw attention to this topic. Um, it's a um, hot discussion, we can say, and um, we expressed our concern to be isolated or people with disabilities uh, concerned, um, express their concern to be isolated and stigmatized as risk groups in some institutions already mentioned, but in Germany as well, it is already prohibited to go outside. This is clearly against the principle of self-determination and the UNCRPD. Um, together with German activists and politicians, I started a petition against the isolation of risk groups. 25,000 people signed that petition and I try to bring it to the German Bundestag. So I'm fighting on the level of member states. Um, triage is also a topic that people with disabilities are very worried about. In Germany, the situation in the hospitals are still good, not comparable with the dramatic situation in Italy, for example, or Spain. Nevertheless, the professional societies for emergencies, medicine already published their triage recommendation. Compared to, St compared to Spain and Italy, of course, um, it's not like in, in, in situation in Germany. Nevertheless, nevertheless, factors like frailty count in the assessments, which means an indirect discrimination of people with pre-existing conditions. The German government does not want to regulate, uh, that's what our Minister for Health Affairs, Jens Spahn, said. Uh, he doesn't want to regulate any triage decisions, so that the weight lies on these illegal recommendations. We organized a webinar with the authors of triage recommendations, doctors, experts, professors, who try to reassure our audience that the decisions would always be taken individually. Nevertheless, the fear remains. So that's our fight here in Germany. And we have to make it clear on the European level that triage or isolation of people with disabilities or diseases um, is against UNCRPD. Thank you. Thank you so much also for the detailed uh, update from what you're doing in Germany, um, Catherine. I would give the floor now, if uh, you are ready, um, to uh, another member of our Disability Intergroup Bureau, Ms. Rosa Esteras. Um, Rosa, are you able to put on your mic or your camera? Yes, yes. Can you help, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, but you're a little quiet. Yes, I, I, uh, now, now is good. I'm checking now. I'm actually also looking at our sign language interpreter to see if she can hear you enough. Yes, but 
is um, I, I I have put the sound in maximum. Okay, I can hear you. Is it okay for Lisa, who's interpreting, okay, and for captioning? Uh, yes, I I put the telephone uh, the, the the computer uh, near me. Okay. Okay, let's see. I will watch and see if the captioning and the sign interpretation is picking you up well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon. I would like to thank uh, EVF, especially uh, Catherine, for organizing this necessary meeting, and the main Spanish organization, Fermi and Once, with whom I have had various meetings in the past weeks. Despite the difficult situation we're in, from their homes, they are doing an extraordinary job in defending the rights of people with disabilities. In this debate, I would like to highlight four priority uses. First of all, and importantly, the coronavirus crisis has intensified discrimination against people with disabilities, especially on equal access to health care. In Belgium, for example, People with disabilities have been discriminated in access to intensive care according to the guidelines adopted for the selection of patients affected to intensive care. This situation or a violation of the principle of no discrimination set out in Article 5 of the United Nations Convention and cannot be repeated. In fact, and Apelai explains different cases in, in Europe. As laid down in the joint resolution adopted on Friday, 17th April, we must ensure that all member states, without exception, warranty access to health care, especially to non discrimination in access to intensive care. Secondly, we must pay particular attention to the institutionalization of people with disabilities, people living in residential institutions or at higher risk of infection and in many cases have not had access to health services. Many facilities suffer from a lack of staff and funding necessary to meet the protective measures required by the coronavirus. Thirdly, I would like to address the very important use of gender-based violence. Anna Pelaez has explained too. In Spain, we have suffered an increase of cases of gender-based violence, which particularly affects girls and women with disabilities. During confinement, it becomes more difficult to file a complaint or to ask for help, which is why the situation has worsened. That is why we must ensure that the new forms adopted for the reporting of gender violence, direct chat, instant messaging, new guidelines for action, etc are also accessible to people with disabilities. And finally, we shall propose a temporary increase of the European Social Fund um, co-financing from 50 to 100 in the areas most affected by the coronavirus. Uh, the, this fund, the European Social Fund, is the key to guarantee the employment of groups a tiger risk of explosion and to support the social entities that care of them. People with, with disabilities must be a priority in the management of the coronavirus crisis now and in the recovery period where we will have to face terrible social and economic consequences. Now, uh, more than ever, we must fight together to guarantee the rights of people with disabilities in the 27 member states. Thank you very much, Catherine, again, and thank you very much to all the members of this, of this seminar. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Rosa, for your intervention. And um, I would like to give the floor now 
to our next member of European Parliament, also in our intergroup, um, Ms. Uh, Krisula Zakharopoulou. Um, perfect, I can see you. Oh, I can't hear you. Let's see. Now I can I can I can see you, but I don't have sound yet. Okay now? Beautiful, perfect. Thank you. I say hello to everybody and uh, I'm very happy to see all of you, uh, all of you that organized this beautiful meeting, the commissioner that uh, the commissioner and all my colleagues uh, and friends. Um, life is very strange, everything changed. And uh, who, who could believe that uh, we can speak uh, through uh, the computer? But uh, the important is that we have to continue to be together and uh, to uh, respect uh, and serve democracy. So, my just a little bit, I will speak one minute just to say that I would like to point out an important point uh, that for me is the case of uh, women with disabilities, especially during this lockdown. We currently see all around the world uh, and uh, in all the countries an uh, explosion of domestic and sexual violence. We know that statistically, disabled women are already more exposed to violence. So all member states, my point of view is that need to ensure assistance that has to, to remain available to them and to take additional strong measures for their protection, and of course, more found. Some member states have already taken measures like France, but they need to include a specific response regarding disability. It just uh, uh, something else uh, regarding women with disabilities and sexual and uh, reproductive health and rights. But we see now that this period, unfortunately, uh, women with disabilities lose their autonomy and they are unable to access uh, physical medical appointments or sometimes even to have access to tele-appointments with doctors or midwives. So we have an example, are the mentally uh, disabled women who will have more difficulties to spot the first signs of unwanted pregnancy. This is uh, again knowing that disabled women are statistically more often also victims of rapes and sometimes less educated on contraception methods. So uh, we have to take into account specific assistance uh, uh, must be provided. Of course, we cannot wait uh, the period uh, of uh, uh, the confinement. And um, I think uh, uh, that uh, we have to continue to put on the center of our attention people with disabilities. And I hope to all of you to be safe and healthy. And I hope, of course, to see you very, very soon in Brussels. Bye from me and from Paris. Thank you so much. And uh, we all look forward to that moment when we can all see each other again. And I would like to give the floor to um, MEP Marianne Vince. I believe maybe coming to us from Denmark. Yes, and, I am. Uh, and we can hear you perfectly. There Thank you. you. I yeah. give you the floor. And uh, thank you for all your speeches and all your great work. My biggest concern right now are the many people who have lost their jobs or at risk of losing their jobs during these uh, difficult times. We know that especially people with disabilities are vulnerable to lose their jobs. Unemployment can trigger both social exclusion and poverty. This was already a big problem before the corona crisis. It does not, however, take into account the needs of people with disabilities to return or have access to the labor market. I believe the Commission must propose a new disability strategy, strategy 
post 2020. And that it must include the right to work and to take active part of the labor market. We need the strategy this year, not next year. Our labor market needs to be adapted to the needs of people with disabilities, not the other way around. I think, for example, the Danish Association of Physically Dis Disabled, I try again. I think the Danish Association of this Physical Disabled sets a great example with their new office space on how to make, make work, workplaces inclusive for everyone with disabilities. It's a wonderful building. In the Employment and Social Affairs Committee, I hope that we will succeed to put pressure on the Commission to push forward for a strategy that also aims for an inclusive labour market for the financial recovery of Europe. Thank you for the word. I look forward to hopefully see you again very soon. Thank you so much. So I think we've all really warmed up because all of the, the sound has got better as we have gone along. Um, we are over time, but I wanted to just um, mention some of the questions and comments that have come in from participants and give the opportunity to, for example, members of parliament to answer any of those before we would go. We, we have MEP Jose Guzmao, who would uh, talk about follow-up actions from the parliament before some closing remarks from the EDF president, Yanis Vardikastanis and MEP Tilly Met. So this would only be a short period of discussion. As I mentioned before, we will take note of any of the other questions that have come in for our, um, uh, the report on this meeting. One thing I think which is more to note for uh, the report on this meeting and going forward is a comment from uh, one of our EDF colleagues from Finland, Pirko Malamaki, on how to count the number of people with disabilities who have died in institutions. Um, we have also had questions about how people with disabilities in sub-Saharan Africa uh, will be supported what the parliament can do about this. So maybe on international cooperation, one of the members of parliament might make some comment. There was the question about statistics and how people with disabilities are not counted. There was also a question for the commissioner, which we can give to the services later in writing about the number of staff with disabilities working within the European Commission. Um, we also have a very specific question about the situation of people with assistance dogs and how they are being uh, treated during this COVID-19 crisis. We had questions about the situation of carers, but I think many MEPs have uh, talked about their commitment to ensuring that within the work-life balance measures of the EU, there will be adequate support to carers. We had another comment which perhaps members of parliament would not be able to answer to but it's worth mentioning here because it has not been mentioned yet is there will be a delay in the reporting to the CRPD committee so already a committee was postponed and has been put in place for August September but uh, as we see, it may not be possible for that committee to take place. So what will happen with the delay? The question was if the EU could actually pro provide facilities for doing things online. But I think that uh, maybe the MEPs don't have an answer for that. There was also, but it, it is worth everyone knowing that the monitoring of human rights will be delayed. The monitoring of the rights of people with disabilities will be delayed because of the committee not being able to work. Um, we understand the committee are working on individual complaints and general comments, but not on country reviews. Um, we had also the comment from Sightsavers uh, representative uh, Ross, who was talking about the World Health Assembly's resolution on COVID-19, that there was no mention of people with disabilities. And this is somewhere perhaps where members of the European Parliament could lend their support to make sure that the UN Action, the World Health Organization, 
um, would be inclusive of persons with disabilities. And that, I think, was a lot of the, the content of the questions which I saw. And I apologise to anyone if I miss something. I promise when we're doing the report that we will, we will get to other things. I just want to see if anyone from, the, from our speakers uh, would like to respond on any of those. I'm looking in the chat box or... So maybe what I can do, if none of the um, members of parliament or other speakers want to respond, it may be any way better for our audience. Oh, I see a hand up. Um, it may be any way better for our audience if we were, um, if we moved on and, and replied in writing to the, the different questions. So yeah, with uh, that... Excuse me. Oh, yes. Yes, I'm Chris. Um, oh, wonderful. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to, to speak about, you know, you spoke about Africa, no? Uh, and the yes. people with disabilities. Yes. I, I am the reporter for the new strategy uh, for the European Parliament, uh, Europe and Africa. Wonderful. And uh, when I travel, uh, I met people with disabilities. And uh, in uh, the chapter, you know, of, for this uh, new strategy, um, uh, for the Parliament, I think, uh, uh, not I think, I'm sure, but I will uh, write something because uh, there is, um, there, I met people that of course they have difficult, uh, they, they live in difficult situation, but I found also, I met people with a lot of courage. So yes, it is part of uh, the new strategy um, that we have to underline that people with disabilities also in Africa uh, have the same rights. I am delighted to hear that you're the rapporteur from the Parliament for that particular um, issue because this is something that uh, the European Disability Forum together with the Africa Disability Forum and DPOs in Africa would be very happy to give you input on. So this is wonderful news. Thank you for letting us know about that and for responding on the question. Is there anyone else from the um, panelists who would like to make any response on anything before I would give the floor to Jose Guzmao. I think with that I will give you the floor um, Mr Guzmao. Uh, thank you so much for um, joining us uh, today to talk about the follow-up actions from the, the Parliament. I'll give you, can you speak just so I can hear you? Hi, uh, yeah, I Wonderful. hope you can hear me. Uh, perfect. Does it work? Yes. Okay, very so uh, uh, very quickly to, to some action proposals. Uh, first of all, concerning the disability resolution and uh, the, the plenary session in May, uh, I think that the concerns about adding resolutions to this session um, are related to the fact that we have a, a, a bunch of discharge files already being voted. But I think we should put some pressure around the disability strategy and we should uh, point out that uh, the COVID impact makes it even more urgent to vote and approve these, uh, this uh, uh, resolution so that the, these citizens are not left even more unprotected as we've, uh, as we've seen that they are. And uh, so I think it would be important for the, um, the, the intergroup co-chairs, the, the five co-chairs, to send a joint letter to the EP president and the presidents of each political group calling for this uh, uh, file to be included in the, in the plenary meeting. Also because we have a very strong consensus in, the, in, in committee about this uh, um, uh, file, so we could probably have a very quick vote on it and it would, be, it, it would have a, a significant uh, impact. And also in the context of, of the strategy, because we do have to uh, uh, weigh in all the effects of the COVID um, crisis, uh, I would like to insist on the point that was made by other MEPs that the, um, the uh, necessary inclusion of the COVID crisis in this strategy uh, has to be made uh, on the basis of systemic consultation with uh, uh, people with disabilities organizations and uh, to make sure uh, that, that this process uh, starts on the right foot. Uh, 
On the coronavirus response investment initiative, I think it would be important to introduce an earmark uh, of EU funding from the, the, the investment initiative specifically to uh, support community-based uh, disability support services. This is sign language interpreters, personal assistants, and all the support people uh, uh, with the, uh, to support people with disabilities in emergency and health settings. And it should be given the same health and safety protection as other healthcare workers dealing with uh, COVID-19. Um, I also think it's important, also uh, taking into account many of the, um, the, the reports that uh, uh, activists and MEPs have made here, to have uh, EU guidelines for vulnerable groups in order not, not for those groups to be uh, treated as, um, uh, as groups, but uh, in order to be uh, individually but correctly uh, um, uh, accompanied. And uh, I think uh, EU guidelines could, uh, the, the European Union could create a set of experts that could uh, help uh, uh, member states to correctly address the specific problems of these um, communities. Also uh, on income protection measures, this is of course a very uh, large topic and, and it relates to the economic uh, response to the COVID crisis. But in any case, uh, whatever the responses uh, come to be, it is important to uh, address the issue of income loss for pe people with disabilities because they are uh, uh, affected in a more serious way by uh, income loss due to unemployment, uh, layoff schemes, and uh, uh, so we need to make sure that, the, um, that these groups are protected uh, from those kinds of um, um, causes for income loss as, uh, as the economic crisis uh, on, uh, We lost you there. We had a very perfect sound, and then we lost you. Sorry, I was receiving a call on my mobile phone. Um, oh, I'm so uh, sorry. Okay, you're back. It is. It is very. Uh, I just rejected it. Uh, it. It is very important to get uh, uh, guidelines also for uh, uh, medical assistance, precisely to avoid uh, what is going on in some member states uh, in, in access to health care and also in uh, protection measures that are, um, uh, well, that are objectionable and attentatory to uh, people with disabilities uh, rights. Finally, I, I think on the uh, negotiations on the EU budget, and we know we're going to have a, a brand new uh, proposal for that, I think it, we, it would be very important for all the MEPs that are involved in uh, the, the debate in the European Parliament to uh, strengthen the support to deinstitutionalization and community-based uh, services. Uh, on EU funds, on uh, uh, increasing uh, EU budget uh, provisions, and also to address uh, accessibility and non-discrimination in, in all EU funding uh, uh, programs. Um, on the Equal Treatment Directive, I think the, the COVID crisis is, uh, uh, poses a, a, a lot of issues that would uh, demand for, uh, for the Council and the Commission to break the the blockade uh, that has been lasting for 12 years on this on this issue uh, and to uh, begin applying it uh, first and foremost on healthcare services on accessibility i uh, i would like to point out uh, it was mentioned uh, at least by one person in this debate the uh, uh, the importance of um, accessibility on uh, education also in remote education, including telelearning, because we, right now we have uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of children that are learning through uh, telelearning, and it's important to ensure that in, in all uh, uh, public programs, in all states, that this is um, ensured. On mobility, uh, I think uh, uh, this was also mentioned, uh, we, we, we must, um, ensure that uh, all decisions taken on mobility uh, uh, um, do not treat uh, pe persons with people with disabilities as um, as a, a, a discriminated group both by um, uh, 
an uninformed uh, perspective on uh, uh, on there being a, a risk group, but also on uh, not uh, taking away all the uh, policies related to uh, um, uh, mobility barriers, which uh, are in many cases um, uh, insufficient, but have to be accompanied. And finally, uh, which was also mentioned, I think we should uh, ensure that all plans discussed in the Parliament to support women should consider women with disabilities and conversely programs uh, uh, with for people with disabilities should also uh, uh, include a, a gender perspective. Uh, I think that um, to just put two final notes, I think that it's very important that the disability intergroup has so many MEPs from different political groups and from different committees. It is very crucial that all the files that we are working on uh, that can relate with uh, the problems of people with disabilities um, have uh, specific uh, provisions for this uh, community. For instance, just to give an example, I'm going to be main rapporteur in the employment guidelines uh, report and it will have uh, provisions specific to people with disabilities. And there are probably uh, several files being discussed right now to, uh, to respond to the COVID-19 crisis uh, that we have uh, MEPs from this intergroup working on. And it's very important that um, we can streamline uh, uh, the, these problems in all of those uh, files. The second very important point that I uh, would like to uh, make is for all uh, MEPs to push for a, a solidary response to the economic crisis, because we know that um, all the good proposals and good intentions will amount to very little if we don't have the financial means to put them in, in practice. And I know that we can count on all MEPs in this intergroup to make these uh, this financial support uh, happen for all member states. Thank you. Thank you so much for a great summary of all the next steps that uh, can, can be taken by the European Parliament and to give us also ideas of where we need to direct our cooperation with the Parliament and with the intergroup in the coming period. So um, I just want to clarify one thing as well because you mentioned all these different activities and of course many speakers have highlighted that the COVID-19 pandemic which was not um, anticipated by any of us has highlighted all of the areas which are incredibly important for persons with disabilities in Europe. Stigma, inaccessibility, discrimination, poverty, lack of access to services, problems with inclusive education, gaps in social protection, all these things. And as the Commissioner for Equality mentioned, there is foreseen the adoption of a strengthened European disability strategy next year. It was asked during this call uh, why it wasn't on the work programme this year, but we know that the Commission is working on it actively this year and that it will be scheduled and included in the work programme next year. So these, this will all give us uh, more opportunity to input with very important data about the situation of people with disabilities in Europe today to inform the Commission's next strategy. So I just want to then um, give the floor for closing remarks. I promise to all our participants uh, that we're very nearly coming to the end. So I was first going to ask um, Yanis Vardikastanis, our president of EDF, to retake the floor for some closing remarks. Nice to see you, Yanis. Thank you, Catherine. Perfect, we can Thank hear you. you. For, Thank you for organizing this very important debate uh, today. You and your colleagues and all the members of the Disability Intergroup uh, Bureau. There is no question that historically, this period draws a line between before the crisis and after the crisis. Socially, economically, financially, politically, hygienically, the aftermath will be completely different. 
A return to the realities before the crisis will be difficult, if not impossible. And therefore, whatever we do, whatever we say from the institutions, from the disability movement, should be aiming to be useful and not pleasant. And that means that we cannot and should not address the reconstruction, in my opinion, and not the recovery period, the reconstruction of the European Union, of European societies and economies, in a way that is inclusive, inclusive of all. Otherwise, the European project will fail, will fail completely. And all of you know that I am a born politically European and that the disability movement is a very pro-European movement. And we have fought for this in all member states. And I would like from this very important meeting today to send a very strong message throughout the Union to the leaders of the institutions to the heads of the member states, to all. The disability movement will be, is already, on a continuous advocacy campaign. Because now we are not dealing with a financial crisis as before. We are dealing with a crisis that we lose people. People die. And those that die, need to be justified in the future, that they bring a real change, even with their deaths, to societies for persons with disabilities. We need a very robust approach from the institutions. We need a European disability strategy that will make the difference in my opinion, there is no justification for not including the European disability strategy in the program of the Commission this year. After all, COVID-19 has changed the program of the Commission this year. And therefore, all the initiatives that are taken for the reconstruction period should include persons with disabilities in the funding, in the political, in the social approach. We need a very strong disability rights guarantee. We need a complete outlaw of funding institutionalization through the structural funds. We need a very strong disability strategy with focal points as we have argued for so long. And now we see how we miss them in the Commission, in the Parliament, in the Council, in the other agencies of the Union. And of course, we need, we need a Union that is mindful of all citizens, that cares. The Commission should include immediately in the COVID-19 task force, Commissioner, Commissioner Daly and Commissioner Schmidt. How come the Equality Commissioner and the Social Affairs Commissioner are not members of the task force? The Commission should take initiative towards the member states. Letters are good, but letters do not guarantee rights. They need to take initiatives now. The parliament has to take initiatives now. The political groups in the parliament should ask their governments in the member states to be very active in the council supporting a new robust approach to disability rights. We have lost people. We should, know, we should never forget this. This is a situation that has not happened after the Second World War, we have lost 
people. We are losing people. People are, are dying. We should never forget this. And I guarantee, as long as I'm present in EDF, that this will never be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yanis, for your closing words, your closing remarks. Um, I would like to give the floor to um, MEP Tilly Metz from Luxembourg, who will give us the closing remarks on behalf of the intergroup. She's also a member of our bureau. I'm just waiting. Oh, Aya, yeah. perfect. I can see you perfectly. Okay. Do you hear me also? <laughs> I can hear you also very well. Thank you. Great. I'm trying to be short because I know we are over time. Um, so I, I'm going ahead. Dear colleagues, uh, dear friends from the European Disability Forum, now on behalf of the Disability Intergroup Bureau, thank you very much to all the participation of today's meeting. I am sure all my colleague Mavs and the Intergroup Secretariat have taken a lot of notes. I've taken four pages. So, uh, and the president of the EDF said it already, it's an historic moment. And it's from now on uh, that we have to decide the direction that we are going to take from now on on the society that we want afterwards. We have heard really about a lot of uh, dreadful situation of large residential institutions which really have become the hotspot of infection and of deaths with no resources and no real help from public authorities. I remember now one situation of Romania which was told where the staff was told to leave to leave the people alone and uh, that they were tests that they get the equipment but not the people with disability so all the persons and also persons with disability in this institution were very often forgotten we've heard it and left on their own we must no longer push persons with disability to live in these large residential centers we must invest EU funds in supporting independent living and community-based services. But even there, we have heard from our colleague from France, Albert Prévost, who told us that even people who live on their own at home didn't get anymore the home help they need, the recurrent health care that they need. So also there were problems. The recovery plans must really also reflect this paradigm shift by supporting these services and the living conditions of persons with disability. We've spoken a lot now in the European Parliament about the Green Deal and about a Green uh, Deal that has to come and also the digitalization challenges. But we would never forget, we should never forget that we need also, and this crisis showed it, a more accessible and inclusive society. We really have, and I'm just pointing out a few points that we have for the next sanitary crisis. I, of course, we have to try to prevent another crisis, but let's be realistic. I think we have to need a real action plan, especially for people with disabilities, so that we have a more inclusive approach, that they have access to treatment, to care. But we also heard from my colleagues that they need to have access to goods, they need to have access to su psychological support. We have some of my colleagues, Anna and Chris Viola, um, they mentioned also the violence and the harassment against women, women with disabilities. And what's more, if women with disabilities are also in socioeconomic problems, then there's another problem is coming there. We need also have good access, and a lot of my colleagues were telling it, a good access to information. But not only people with a disability need good access to information, but also the professionals. And we heard of my colleague Jose Guzmao, who was speaking of EU guidelines for the people. And then there was another important topic is for children with disability. And it was mentioned several times that they also need to have uh, a right to education online, not that the gap between the other children even gets bigger. So we also have, in this terrible crisis, we can make also one of the conclusion is the urgent need for European anti-discrimination anti -discrimination legislation. 
Today, we really heard about cases of persons with disability being deprioritized or directly, directly denied the necessary health care because of their disability. This is absolutely shameful for the European Union. And I hope events like this so important, one can bring us all together to make this unavoidable and also in the future, I think, and I was happy about some uh, events, also some um, future actions the Commissioner uh, Dali was taking. She spoke about this equality person who is there in every DG. She spoke about the importance of the dialogue and also her commitment in order that uh, things are changing. And then a lot of my colleagues, Jose Guzmao at the end, also said the importance of a strong post-20 disability strategy and that we should vote this resolution already in May. And then another important issue, and I want to uh, tell it again because it's an important issue, is the funding. A lot of my colleagues, also from Lithuania, but also other countries, said now that we are doing some efforts into more an inclusive society, let's do not cut down the funding on the services for people with disabilities. Another colleague mentioned also the risk of losing their jobs and then getting into more exclusion and poverty. And then this important idea was mentioned by several people also the task force uh, now in the post for the post COVID period that there has to be people with disability in the expert committees and in the uh, uh, task force. And then let me remind me, or uh, let me remind you, a very important initiative of my colleague Katrin Langenzieten, who was pointing out the problem now in the lockdown period, in the exit of the lockdown period, that we shouldn't categorize people and push, putting them or, or pushing them into even more isolation of these risk groups. We cannot categorize people and speak in general. This is something we have to speak with the people and not over their head by generalizing like that. Um, the disability intergroup will keep on advocating, but not only advocating, also fighting for a change of direction that brings persons with disability, with disabilities on an equal basis with others, and also recognize their special needs. We already appreciate very much all of your help by bringing to the EU debate your experiences. Also, I found it very interesting the, info, the information we got from these different countries. But we need more. We really need to do an evaluation, an assessment, and really a debriefing what all we have learned from this crisis concerning especially the situation uh, for persons with disability. And we do, as Intergroup, really the commitment as an Intergroup to keep involving you in all these measures and all the policies we have to think also of the situation of people with disability. Once again, and I wanted to be short, once again, thank you very much for the participation and all your work. And before concluding, I really want to thank also the sign uh, language interpreters who did a great job and now for a lot of time already uh, the live captioner and also the secretary of the intergroup and and their uh, very important support also for organizing it is thank you to all and stay safe thank you very much thank you very much for your closing words and uh, you've already given thanks to everyone who has helped us organize the meeting uh, and I wish everyone a very good evening. As I said, we will put a report of the meeting on our on the website of the Disability Intergroup. Any extra questions that were left, we will look at and respond to. We really appreciate your active participation and questions, and we look forward to taking the next steps uh, together with the Disability Intergroup and all of our members and partners. So we'll end there. Thank you very much. <laughs>